Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm going to stand over here because I'm afraid the, um, the fan is, is great, but it's making me feel like I'm blowing away. So I hope you can hear me. Um, so firstly, welcome uh, to this event this morning. Um, it's great to have you here. My name is Helen O'Connor. I'm a principal researcher for climate finance at the International Institute for Environment and Development. Oh, that's quite scary. Um, <laughs> I wasn't expecting that. Um, so we welcome you to this really, hopefully, really interactive session to discuss the importance of accountability in the provision of climate finance. Um, not only do we want to hear from a great panel and a great moderator who's going to take us through that shortly, Una May, who's sitting, sitting over there, um, but we'd also like to maximise participation. So please do be ready to have a little breakout huddle and talk through some of the issues that you're going to hear about this morning. So why are we here? Why do we need better accountability for climate finance? So I'm going to highlight three main things. And I think the first thing to remind us all and to kind of set the scene is the, the challenging environment with regard to trust between the providers of finance and the recipients of finance. The trust is not particularly great. Uh, the, the challenges in terms of meeting the, the 100 billion goal and not meeting it, um, and the difficulty in understanding where the finance is going, how much is going, and how much is going to the local level. So trust is, is low, or is challenged. So not only have we got a gap in the amount of finance, there's also this question about the quality of that finance. So how much of it really is reaching the local level? And how can we actually tell? And how can communities help hold providers to account for the finance that they've said they're going to provide to the local level to support locally-led adaptation and adaptation action? And then finally, there's lots of different systems out there. There's lots of different systems for reporting, for... Uh, trying to interpret that data, and it's quite difficult. There's not a common set of, uh, of tools and approaches that people can use. So how can we bring people together to perhaps get a shared or common agreement about some of the, uh, the ways in which data is, is uh, shared and the finance is flowing? So those are three, I suppose, of the bigger pieces that we're looking at. So we're going to hear today from a great panel. I'm going to introduce two speakers in a moment who are going to help us set the scene. And then we're going to move into an interactive panel discussion, which, uh, which will be moderated by Una May. And then we'll have some breakout groups followed by some feedback, and there's a few little pieces of reflection from colleagues from the Netherlands and IID. But I'd like to start by inviting Anne from the government of Norway. I'm afraid I'm not going to attempt to pronounce your surname, if that's all right. Um, Tivnirim? How do I pronounce it? So I'm going to hand over to you to introduce yourself. Thank you very much, Anne. Good morning, and pardon me for coming a little bit late. We've been running around trying to find the, the right space. I think uh, that's, that's, a, that, that, that's an experience or a feeling I think we've all shared during this week. But here I am, uh, and thank you for inviting uh, me to, have, uh, to say a few words on this extremely important topic, very, very close to my heart. Um, sorry, I'm just gonna... Because we know, well, we all know the problems. You are here because you know the problem, but you also know that uh, it's a real uh, challenge that a lot of the adaptation uh, finance and climate fin finance for resilience does not get down to the local level. Just yesterday, 
I uh, I took part in an event and I, I before I was briefed, I was told by my team that an estimated 10% of funds for adaptation actually gets down to the local level and that is close to a tragedy. And for me as Minister of International Development, uh, allocating these funds, you know, we need to make sure that the money gets out there to the communities. Because the local communities are at the front line of the crisis. Um, they, they know where the challenges are, but they also know what the solutions are and they have the resources and the know-how to deliver if we all help out. Um, so that's why I'm happy to be here, to have this opportunity to, uh, uh, within the frames of, of uh, this event on driving the quality of climate finance. And I'm happy to, uh, happy to underline uh, how Norway is endorsing these principles of locally-led adaptation. It's an important piece of work. And I truly believe that when adhered to, because that's it's still a way, we, we still need to implement this, but when adhered to, this will greatly enhance the quality of uh, climate finance and uh, adaptation finance. So in our partnership agreements, especially with multilateral funds, we have safeguards that should ensure that local population is involved in project planning and implementation. But we as donors, Norway as donor, has to follow up to ensure that the funds that we support have that good quality and the, and the su sufficient safeguards out there. And you know, it's, as minister, it's nothing more frustrating than to work on safeguards, work on principles, and then afterwards go out there and speak to civil society and speak to community and hear that it's not working in practice. So we I know we still have a way to go, but transparency really is key. Transparency is key. So um, we, could, uh, we could do so, as we often do, by asking for reporting on indicators on finance for local actors, by challenging partners on barriers, to ensuring that financing is reaching the local level. Uh, but now in the future, we will use these principles on locally led adaptation in the dialogue with our partners. And I, I hope it will help. I believe it will help. It's a good piece of work. So I wish you all a fruitful discussion. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's, um, uh, let me just stop off by saying, you know, it's. It's great to be at the COP, but I think, I think I share with all of you in the audience uh, uh, an impatience to get the action on the ground. So thank you for your work and let's work together. Thank you. Fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much for joining us. But in particular, thank you for your really warm and great words there. Not only the endorsement of the principles, but also that focus for us all on actually adherence to them, implementation and really making a difference and a change. So it's fantastic. Thank you so much for joining us um, this morning to share, share your news with us. Um, I'm now going to just ask for a uh, colleague, Sheila Patel, to reflect uh, from uh, her very long involvement uh, with, with the principles, but also her longer term involvement at the grassroots level. Um, so Sheila, over to you. You have to tell me when it's three minutes, if you're giving me five minutes. <laughs> Should I sit or stand? Yeah, it's up to you, Sheila. <laughs> So my name is Sheila Patel. I live and work in Mumbai. I set up an organization with an amazing network of slum dwellers in 1984, so you know how long I've been working. And in 1992, we were invited to South Africa to, to meet people from 80 townships where apartheid had produced these black and colored neighborhoods to look at what post-apartheid habitat would be 
And through that, we had the amazing privilege to work with Joe Slovo, who was our, our hero at that time. But the long and short of that is that that created an organization or a social movement called Slum Dwellers International, which is an organization of slum dwellers where informal settlements in cities in a country form an organization and become members of STI. And we as professionals, who are the legal entities through whom money flows, is a affiliate. So we twist and turn the thing so that the communities are not our tails, but we are their tails. And since 1986, we have been struggling to explore what constitutes real partnerships. And we've been involved in many fake partnerships. And though we call them fake, because we are partners, but we have no right to say anything, to negotiate anything. And we have to sign on legal contracts, many of which poor people don't understand the implications of. And we end up behaving like we are lying, cheating, and stealing because those processes are just not possible for poor people to undertake, but who did not have the experience to negotiate or the power to negotiate the change of those things. So for us, the LLA principles have begun to develop for us an articulation and a clarity of what we want to put on the table and to have the courage to tell people with big bucks and lots of zeros that these things can't happen. And we've had a few successes but in most instances, those wonderful people in these fabulous multilateral and bilateral institutions move away and their institutions forget the fabulous stuff they did with us and we start back from zero. So for me, the accountability represents three things. One is we are all of us, whether you are a multilateral, you're a philanthropy, you're a national or a global NGO, and if you are communities, everybody has certain things that are difficult or impossible for them to do. Can we all put that on the table and negotiate something that is just and equitable? One of the things, you know, when we, and now we've become procurement experts because now we know all the red lights when they come up. So one of the mamas of our federation said, you know, my son has been trained by the government to produce alternate solar energy for houses. So if he gets the contract for our housing, is that, is that wrong? Is that illegal? After all, he's the son of a very poor single woman. He got trained to do this. Should I give him the opportunities or he is denied that because he's my son and I am the, I'm the chair of the local group? So we have things like that which come up for which we have answers. But they are treated as too micro for these big discussions. And then everybody comes to me and says, but I have a lawyer who has to be applied. So the long and short for me is all of you who are at different levels, do you have the time, the intellectual and social commitment to walk through this process with us? And if you get your institution to sign for this, how realistically can we hold them accountable? Today, how many organizations have signed on for LLA principles? I know at least three-fourths of them who are not following it at all. And I would like to have the guts on behalf of the LLA group to call them out. Because otherwise, numbers don't mean anything. So thank you. Fantastic, Sheila. So again, that call for accountability, that call for local communities being able to hold providers to account, to, uh, yeah, to deliver that change and to help get the, the finance flowing. So great, great ending message there, Sheila. Uh, cool. Hopefully when we get to the breakout groups, you can 
talk through some of these issues. Um, but with no further ado, I am going to hand over to the wonderful Una May, who's going to moderate a quickfire panel. Um, so lots of interaction, hopefully, about to, to really kick off. So over to you, Una May. Thank you so much, Helen, and welcome to this session. Um, after Gina, I don't know if I'm qualified to be here, but I'll do my best. I think, um, as, as you heard, I'm Una May Gordon. I'm from Jamaica, um, where quite a bit of our local communities and young people are, are involved. And I have the awesome privilege of the panel that I'll introduce to you to help us dissect the issue just a little bit more. Um, local level adaptation, all adaptation is local for us. And therefore, we're going to be dissecting the, the issue. I think I'll, I'll use as a point of departure for some of you who was in the, the high level segment on when the cup opened, that young activist who spoke to say, we don't believe you. I think that was a word that, that resonated. It's a question of transparency and trust. And so as we, as we dissect this issue, I want us to remember it's, it's all about really transparency and trust for adaptation and adaptation finance to move forward. So let me sit and let me get the name of my panelist and let me get them correctly. I'm going to butcher the names as well. So forgive me. <laughs> so let me introduce, it's Grace here. Grace, and Grace here, last name is Balawag. I got that right. Can you join us? And Grace is a deputy coordinator of the Indigenous Peoples International Center for Policy, Research and Education. Got that right as well. And then we have Catherine, Catherine Brown, who is online. I think Catherine is online. And she's a research fellow at the Stockholm Environment Institute. And then I have Hisingoma. I got it right. <laughs> and he's the head of International Development Advisory Services and KPMG in Africa, and also head of ESG Africa. And then I think I have Pravin Mansing, who is... I think you had Raju, but he's replacing Raju on the panel. And I'm going to, to be very quick to just direct some questions here at the panel. Very quickly, you have a few minutes to answer and to give, just really give your perspective. And I'll start with the lady first, as always. Two ladies. The lady present here first. Um, and I will, I will ask you, Grace, as an indigenous people, I just had a great workshop in Belize for the indigenous people talking climate change and local action. So it's great to have you here. But as an IP observer to the CIF, what have you seen on, on the steps taken by CIF to be accountable to local actors and the, the Climate Investment Fund, particularly as you sit there as an underrepresented woman and member of the indigenous group? Yes, good morning, everyone. Happy to have all of you here to listen to us, and it's a great opportunity to be part of the panel. Anyway, going directly to your question, yes, I had been an observer with the Climate Investment Fund. From the very start, we had been uh, requesting the subcommittees on the Forest Investment Program under the CIF to provide dedicated funds for indigenous peoples and local communities. And uh, because we know we cannot compete with governments and with international NGOs who are really getting, getting all these funds. So we wanted a dedicated funds direct, with direct access of local communities and indigenous peoples because we are really locally based. 
we are we have national organizations, but our territories and uh, ecosystems are very local. So we were able to get uh, this fund. It's called the Dedicated Grant Mechanism for Indigenous Peoples and Local Communities. And uh, we also insisted that we participate in developing its operational guidelines and framework, and as well as in and putting together the governance structure at global level to the local level. And we were granted this by the World Bank or the Climate Investment Fund. And uh, we set this up and it's up and running since 2012. Uh, yes, and uh, under this dedicated grant mechanism, we have uh, allocated funds for the countries uh, who will be implementing this under the forest investment program. And under each country, we have national steering committees. At a global level, we have a global steering committee in, composed of indigenous peoples and local community leaders who are from the countries who will be implementing this. At the country level, we have national uh, steering committees who are also the governing body for this fund. And uh, to be able to reach the communities, we make sure that uh, there will be a call for proposals, but these are supposed to be submitted by local organizations, which have really been endorsed by their traditional government systems or their local government authorities. And they are, that they are existing on the ground and they had been working on the ground. We also have dedicated funds specific for women and youth. So, uh, for example, uh, very simple, water catchment is, and the storage is very important for women. And uh, some of the organizations have submitted requests for, to support this. And uh, this has is the burden for, of women who go to fetch water every day. And uh, because of this, they also had already some time to to, to spend for their organizational activities instead of being uh, uh, yeah, and limited to the domestic uh, chores that they have today every day. And also, some of the communities and indigenous peoples also had uh, mapped or had uh, done mapping for their territories and resources within their territories. And they have their own traditional knowledge systems on how to do this, on how to indicate the landmarks for this. But because of the, the territories in the forest area, uh, we needed to provide support for the global positioning systems or the, the GPS and then other tools and gadgets that they could make use to really also support them. So all these appropriate uh, technologies and innovations at the local level are really very significant to help local communities in their adaptation programs. Uh, I think I'll end there and then can say some more later. Thank you very much. Thank you, Grace. And if, if we have time, we, I'll come back to you with a, a real question, another question which I, which I have for you. I'm going to, to go, we have heard from, from Grace as, as indigenous people, and I'm going to leave Catherine for the last because she's also part of the, the UNFCCC process. And I'm going to go to Ising Goma because you are from the private sector, um, the other perspective. And therefore, I want to ask you, who are you accountable to? The private sector is the one with the money, the private sector is the one who think that they, they can run things, as in Jamaica we say, who are you accountable to? And what are approaches to accountability and ESG that you could share with us? Uh, thank you so much, Mai. Yes, the private sector has been given a license by the public that provides the resources. As a public, as a private sector, we owe a lot to the public. It gives us workers. It gives us resources that go into the production process, including the water, including the energy. It gives us 
a lot. And therefore, as a private sector, we have to be accountable to the public. And the issue of trust that Anne has talked about is so critical. If the private sector, whatever actions and inactions that you undertake in terms of private sector, they must demonstrate that you are sustainable, you are doing it for the greater good, and you are doing right all the time. That's when you will be sustainable. That's when you can be able to think about that really my goals, my long-term strategy is clearly aligned with what the world demands. The other, the accounting appro accountability approaches, I could say they are basically two. One is the known one where most of the time we come out from the private sector, we just publish our reports, and these are audited by independent auditors and all that. But the wider accountability comes from what the public which vindicates you in terms of consumers, in terms of customers, in terms of suppliers, to continue giving you a license. When they continue buying your products where they have choice, and mark the word choice, when they continue getting employed by you, continuing with you, then you know that's an accountability that is real, which goes to the ground. When I get time, I'll be able to share with you our approach to accountability in terms of our program we have implemented in Tanzania, funded by the UK government over 10 years. At a local level, it meant the citizens have been empowered. The citizens can be able to engage. They have learned and they can become adaptive. In terms of demanding accountability from politicians, accountability from the implementers, accountability from the private sector. To us as KPMG, if the citizens are empowered, they can analyze, they can learn, and they can be able to adapt and be able to hold everybody responsible. That means a lot for us in private sector. Thank you. Excellent. We're, 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 getting, we're getting somewhere. And, and I'm going to go to your problem. Um, he's the program director of the Prakriti Resource Center. I hope I got that right. And, and I know we are working in Nepal, uh, where the government is trying to establish a system of accountability. So can you tell us what Nepal is doing to meet its commitment to LLA, and how you engage women's group in this process? Uh, thank you, Uname, uh, for the questions. Uh, let me start with uh, the second part of the questions uh, regarding what we are doing with the women's groups and how we are enhancing the local level accountability. Uh, those who are not familiar with Nepal, a bit of context. Uh, as you know, Nepal is one of the pioneering countries who has introduced the local level adaptations accents and LAPA was the concept that was invented in Nepal, the local level plan of accents. And over the years, Nepal has developed uh, several LAPAs uh, and funds are flowing at the local government's levels. Uh, but many of these LAPAs were not being implemented and the resources were often underutilized. Though it's in inadequate, the resources, but uh, the, whatever the resource that has been allocated at the local level uh, was, not, uh, was not utilized. So in this context, we started our work with the OMENS groups to hold the local government accountable for the plans and for the, for the utilizations of the resources that they receive as a climate finance and adaptation finance. So what we did is that we had informed and uh, empowered the local groups regarding the adaptation plans and also the constitutional and legal mandates that local government has on the climate adaptations. And also uh, regarding the government budget plans and programs because local government uh, in Nepal has a specific mandates as per the new constitutions and they have a specific plans and budgets every year. So we inform and capacitate them and, and with this, uh, the women's group started engaging on 
with the local government and we in the last couple of years of their continuous engagements we do have uh, some success like uh, many of the local governments are integrating climate adaptation plans uh, in, the, in, the, in their annual plans and budgets and few of the women's groups are actually accessing the money from the local government to undertake the climate adaptation actions that they have prioritized especially most of them are gender just climate actions as as say and finally uh, uh, beside adaptations what we realize is that this sort of initiatives okay this sort of initiatives are contributing towards the changing power relationship between women's groups and the local government because when we started the women's groups uh, were never uh, re recognized by the local government as stakeholders but over the years when they are starting to interact with the local governments they realize that local government uh, women's groups can play a role in the climate adaptations and many of the women's group reported that uh, uh, now they are local governments are inviting them to other environmental issues apart from the climate adaptation so so this okay so uh, this is the initiatives that we had initiated in last few years uh, in Nepal, and it has resulted in good works. Uh, my final words uh, on the negotiations, on the, especially in the global goal of adaptations, uh, as I am following it, uh, since we are pushing for adapt, uh, implementations and more finance uh, for adaptations, accountability should be a part of the global goal of adaptations framework. And it has to be local-led and gender-just. The principle of gender-just, local-led climate adaptation has to be a part of the uh, GGA discussion. So with this, uh, I rest my case. I will be happy to answer more. Thank you. <laughs> the, the, the case is clear. So there, there will be no jury. <laughs> So, so uh, really, it, 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 it's been a great discussion. And, and so I'm going to turn to Catherine now. Catherine is online, so we'll pivot to her as, as the online system goes. And I'll ask you, Catherine, what does accountability? You heard Prakip just now about that being part of the GGA, which is the mechanism within the UNFCCC system. And so what does accountability mean in the context of the UNFCCC? How really does the UNFCCC understand and approach this enhanced transparency? And, and we're adding trust to that, um, this transparency framework that's coming up. Over to you, Catherine. Thank you. I hope you can hear me okay. Thanks for the opportunity to join you remotely. Um, I only have a few minutes, so I wanted to make just a few quick points. Um, to answer your question, um, accountability in the UNFCCC is really accountability between state, uh, specifically national governments. Um, so we see this concept of accountability play out in the transparency mechanisms of the UNFCCC. So the transparency framework, as you mentioned, but also the global stock take, um, perhaps the GGA, we'll see, um, which are really designed to ensure that we can tell whether states are doing what they say they're going to do. So when it comes to adaptation finance, the main questions of accountability are really, first, are contributor countries providing the money they say they're going to provide? Um, Helen mentioned earlier, probably not. Um, but also, are recipient countries following the rules that have been negotiated at the international level? So this is really a pretty narrow understanding of accountability. It's between states, and it's largely about money and rules. Um, so the second point I want to make is that this concept of accountability, um, the way that it translates into the way the UNFCCC supports on the ground adaptation, it makes that adaptation very upward looking. So uh, I'm drawing here on my experience doing uh, research on adaptation fund projects in, in Madagascar and Mauritius as part of my PhD. And in these cases, which I think are really representative, um, upward looking really meant that the projects were designed for national and international actors and not for the communities where they were actually implemented. So first and foremost, the projects were accountable to the funder. They had to follow their requirements and align with the fund's overall goals. The priorities for the projects were also set by the national governments through the NAPA process, um, National Adaptation Plans of Action. And then they also needed to be accountable to international intermediaries, in this case, uh, UNEP and UNDP. Um, and so it really was about what fit those intermediaries' mandates and also what was 
feasible, even convenient for them. And so communities really come last on this list if they're meaningfully consulted at all. And I think this is why, again, to refer back to what Helen was saying, we're seeing that internationally funded adaptation is, is largely ineffective uh, with a lot of maladaptation. And also why we're seeing that funding is failing to reach uh, the most vulnerable communities and the most vulnerable people. Um, so the last point I want to make is that we do know that adaptation is unfolding at the local level with or without international support. And the question I think and hope that we can get into in the panel and in the breakouts is how can the UNFCCC enable that adaptation, learn from it, and then also scale it up where it's effective. So I think doing this will require sort of flipping the accountability framework upside down, so to speak. So instead of communities being accountable to international and national actors for the type of adaptation they decide to do with international funds, international and national actors need to be accountable to those communities. And I think there's no hiding the fact that this is a huge challenge because this is just not the way the UNFCCC is designed to operate. But I will offer a few ideas on how we could start and maybe we could get into these more. So one is to increase funding for enhanced direct access, which are mechanisms that already exist, which allow local organizations and local governments to directly access funding. The next is to increase the visibility of local priorities for adaptation. And I think that local and national civil society organizations are really an untapped resource here. They could be communicating these priorities upward and maybe aggregating them. And they can also hold national governments to account in the way that the Catherine, international Catherine, mechanisms cannot. Catherine, if I could ask you to wrap up your intervention, I'll, I'll probably have a chance to come back to you. Sure, um, we can stop then. here. That's perfect. Okay. Thanks. Apologize. <laughs> no worries. So, so I'm going to I'm going to go back to you, Grace, because I think the from an indigenous people and from being on the CIF and from working with the CIF and the great work that you're doing, I want to ask you directly, what's not working? What is missing? What else? Yeah. Uh, yes. For local ownership of all of these initiatives from the ground, uh, we start Accountability for us starts on the free prior and informed consent process. So we inform them of the, uh, of the different designs or different uh, platforms that they can make use of. And then they will be the ones to determine what are their priorities and how they should be designing and implementing these initiatives. So ownership starts from the very start, and they, there should be social, inclusive social uh, in, uh, participation of all the sectors within the ground level, the women, the youth, the traditional elders, and, other, and the local authorities of government as well. And uh, they collectively design these projects and uh, uh, yeah, make, and then do the, the required reporting as well as uh, monitoring and evaluation of all these projects by themselves. They validate it on the ground, and all of the reports are really from the ground. So uh, that's how they really define accountability in our case. For example, what does not work? is really not involving the, the women, the children, all the other elders that are there, the local authorities. It is this initiative, this dedicated grant mechanism is a unique partnership among the indigenous peoples, local communities, will, working with their local governments, working with the World Bank team if necessary, and other sectors, the scientists, the academe, and other technological uh, support that they would need from different sectors. I think I end there. Thank you. What we are hearing is whole of community, not just whole of society, but whole of community approach when we're talking adaptation. And I'll go to you, Prakash, what, what is missing, really? I mean, you, you outlined clearly from Nepal, holding government accountable, working with the government, but I'll ask you the same question. What is missing? And, and really, how is it working so well with you? Thank you. Uh, to me, I think the transparency and the responsive governance is what we miss 
when you're talking about the uh, accountability in climate uh, financing, transparency at all levels, right from the donors to the local governments. So we need to maintain the transparency in, in terms of adaptation financings and adaptation actions that we are planning to do. So that's one. Second is the, uh, as I said, is the responsive governance systems. Uh, so that ha the government system has to be responsible towards the people and especially to the most vulnerable uh, like uh, women and the indigenous community. So I believe that these two are the key to establish the accountability. Thank you. And, and I'll ask the private sector, what about data? Where do you get your data? What, what, what's missing? Where, where, what, how do you proceed without, where do you get your data? If you're accountable to the public sector and the people, what about data? Thank you. Data, you have to be very, very analytical and creative in terms of where you get your data. Data must be from sources which are trusted, sources that are credible, sources that are verifiable that you can be able to use and say now this information can be used to report on what is progressing. If the private sector is reporting on outcomes, the sources must be verifiable, the sources must be credible, and must be where citizens themselves can be able to access and say this information is true. This greenwashing we keep hearing data in papers, companies reporting such information. We must be able to verify that. And I go back to what I said earlier. What works is when the citizens themselves or the society itself can be able to analyze that data, it can continue learning, and then adaptation will be able to happen. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. I'm going to, to open just a little bit to the audience. If you have one question I can take from anyone here based on what you heard from everybody. We have, I think, two minutes to, to wrap up this session. Is there anybody online here who would want to ask one question? <laughs> if nobody's here, you can ask. All your uh, presentations have been really very good. And I picked three things out of this. One is this thing that you spoke about, which is of underutilization of very little money. It really talks about systemic failure, if that happens. And we need in LLA to track this, because we grumble that there isn't enough money. And we know, I can tell you in India, in all social sectors, there is an underutilization of very little money. That's one. The second thing is data. You talk about people's data. Poor people's data, which is collected, has to work very hard to be legitimate. So we compete with consultants to show that we are better data collectors for the things that you say, because we can now say, this person in this locality does this thing. But we have to compete and we have to work harder than everybody. So that legitimation is not taken for granted or acknowledged. It has to be worked very hard. So I want you to think about that and have a much longer relationship with community groups that collect first class data. Let me close the panel by agreeing that Traditional knowledge is important in local adaptation, locally led adaptation. And maybe the private sector can start to pay the community people to collect their data, trusted data. Let me close this panel and thank the awesome panelists for, for their intervention. Thank you all very much. <laughs>
um, supporting local decision making and boards. We heard about um, the social license to operate for the private sector and a, a call for the need for more reliable data, um, as well as empowering local actors to engage in processes. Um, we also heard from Katie this sort of slightly different picture about the UNFCCC, this sort of very narrow accountability between states um, and this upward accountability. And I, and I like Katie also said, this needs to be flipped upside down. So what I'm going to present this morning is um, our attempt to sort of change that direction a little bit. Um, so we'll share that method in a minute. Um, but, so, can I have the next slide, please, whoever's doing it? Next slide, please. <laughs> All right, I'll just keep going. So my first slide was going to be a very brief recap of some of the challenges about accountability. So really, one of the main ones is traceability. We've got a lot of data. There's a huge amount of data coming from providers. Um, the problem is we don't know where that money goes. We lose track of it once it enters national systems. A second related one is to do with intelligibility. And by that, I mean, sometimes I'm speaking from personal experience here. Sometimes it feels like you need a statistics degree to actually be able to use this data. Um, it's very difficult. The third one is to do with intermediation. Um, intermediaries play a vital role. They can really add a lot of value, but they also keep actors separate, especially the providers of finance, bilateral providers, and the end users of finance. And that can stop feedback going between these actors. And then again, something that Katie touched on, it's upwards. You're only ever really accountable for the per to the person who provided you finance, and that needs to change. Um, next slide, please. So, some specifically thinking more about LLA, we've got some clear gaps in terms of knowing where finance is going, what's worked, how much targets the local level. Um, is it actually aligning with the principles? Um, Sheila made the very valid point that often communities are providing that information and it just falls out. Um, so it's clear that we need to try to find a better way of providing accountability in this system. So next slide, please. And here's a reminder of the principles, if anybody needs them. And I just wanted to sort of stress the point that I think that if you've endorsed the principles of LLA, then you've opted in to be accountable for them. That's a really important point. Um, and the method that I'm about to present, very briefly, um, is an attempt to provide that accountability in terms of making the existing money that we have for LLA go further so that we can do more and better LLA with existing funds. Also, so that we can develop streamlined and standardized deliverables around LLA, and that's vital to help providers of finance to put more money in. So those are kind of the two, the two key objectives of this. And then more specifically, our methodology seeks to build and generate more knowledge and, and bring in existing knowledge, especially from underrepresented groups in this process, and also to build a shared understanding of the challenges and the opportunities around that so that we can do more better LA and get in, crowd in more money. Can I have the next slide, please? Right. So, our methodology, which I'm going to present very quickly, so please do come and talk to us afterwards if you'd like to learn more about it. Um, it's at a very early stage, um, and we are really, really keen to talk to more partners about this and crowd in more ideas. So today's already been fantastic for that. So our methodology has three interconnected work streams. The first of which um, is really focused on the data that providers of finance uh, make available. So there's two parts to this. The first is we take four different data sources. Uh, we take the OECD CRS. We take the International Aid Transparency Initiative data, UNFCCC reporting, and providers biennial reporting. We combine the records, so if there's something which is on one which is the same as something on another, we combine those, and then we bring in all of the associated information, PDFs, project reports, web pages, so that we have a huge amount of information, everything that's available for specific projects. Um, we just piloted that. Uh, it works quite well. We are able to add a lot more information, um, two clear things which have emerged already from this process, two things that providers can do to be more transparent and to help this process. One, standardize. 
more standardized reporting equals more transparency. It's, 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 it's not easy, but it's a clear first option. And the second, the consultant that we've been working with, he said if he could have a day with uh, somebody from each government to help him to work out how to put together the different uh, codes to do this, that would, again, that would make this work so much better. So some clear asks already emerging. The second part is um, using machine learning, using natural language processing. And this is essentially just a tool of effectively reading all of that information. Um, so it would take human being absolutely ages to do that. So using natural language processing to look for indicators of LLA. We'll talk more about indicators afterwards if anybody's interested. But looking, for example, how uh, the underlying drivers of vulnerability are framed in the adaptation framing what governance level finance targets, for example. So the output of that would be to give us a quantitative understanding of the way that providers are reporting their finance. But that's only part of the picture, of course. So the second work stream focuses on quantitative scorecards, and that's where we will ask different types of stakeholders involved in programming climate finance to answer the same questions. And again, it's, it's all about the principles of LLA. So as an example, we might ask the provider, an intermediary, a recipient, was this funding flexible? So if, if, if the provider says yes, it was, and the recipient says no, it wasn't, then we know already that, that we've got a bit of a disjuncture there, a difference of opinion. So that gives us a lot more information about where LLA is happening and where it isn't. And then that, the third part of this work stream, or work stream three, sorry, is then a series of dialogues. Specifically can be about those points of difference, um, but it can also be more general. These dialogues take place in neutral, neutral locations to try to make it a, a comfortable dialogue between different recipients, intermediaries, providers, um, with a view to building a shared understanding about some of the challenges and some of the opportunities. So again, the same example, it would be an opportunity for the provider to explain why they haven't or can't be more flexible. It would be an opportunity for the intermediary to learn about how they can try to improve that flexibility and for the recipient to understand why and to be able to really explain the impact of that and to try and work out a common solution to be able to, to improve the flexibility of that finance. Again, with the view to be able to make the funding relationship better so that we can have more LLA, better LLA, and so that providers feel more confident to be able to put more money into LLA. So, next slide, please. So, yeah, just to summarize, this is our infographic. Um, we begin by collating the data using machine learning to be able to produce a quantitative outcome. This, this could even eventually lead to this kind of certification to be able to hold endorsers really to account for whether or not they are doing LLA and improving. The second part is to sort of validate those findings and to highlight areas of difference. And then the third part is dialogue so that we can agree a common way forward and ultimately so that providers of finance can go away and reform their practices and recipients can go away and change the way they work to help that process. Um, that's our methodology. Um, please do come and speak to us afterwards if you'd like more information um, or to discuss it, especially if you want to discuss the practicalities of any of the data. Um, and also, we certainly work streams two and three. These are things that we're going to be developing next year. These are, we're going to be co-producing these with our partners in our LLA consortium. These are going to be country-specific, locally specific, and these are qualitative indicators that we need to develop uh, in collaboration. So, next slide. I'm just now going to um, set up our breakout rooms, this conversation. But I think actually what we're going to do is just, people are just going to turn around and speak to the people next to them, just have a conversation. So building on the panel discussion in particular, but then also thinking about our 360 account accountability methodology, um, what do you think? What approaches are working? How do we do accountability better? What's missing from, from the, the approach that we just presented here? And, and what, what, what sort of things need to be built into that? How can we do it better? Anyway, I, I'll hand back to you in a May, but it might be that we go straight to breakout rooms.
okay. Okay, I gave you chocolate so you could finish early and on time. <laughs> we gave you chocolate so you could finish on time. I hope you got it. Um, we're going to come right back. Sorry, um, it's a dynamic space and the discussion, we have to keep the discussion going. So we're going to just turn the chairs back and as family so that we can, I hope online, we had a great discussion as well, Nicole, was online, I think. Thank you all for that really intense, really intense, but great discussion, I hope. It was, I'm seeing everybody nodding, and, and, and we could keep on with this discussion for the entire COP, but part of the course, as they would say, we, we still have to find our way around the venue, and we need time for that. So I'm going to, to go straight into a little bit of reflection here, asking the, the facilitators of the group, me and Nicole is online, and Helen, who was doing the group here, you have one minute. Okay, um, so we had a rich discussion and we had lots of examples. So I'll summarize them. One is co-production is really important um, and making sure that we identify the different needs of communities together. Um, and also we felt it was important to have very good monitoring systems in place and making sure that there are systems to monitor uh, how effective financing is on the ground. Um, we also spoke a little bit about risk and access to finance as well. Um, those are not, fall outside a little bit the realm of accountability, but they are integral to making sure that local communities um, have access to finance so that investors can take more of a risk um, in getting finance to the local level. Thank you, May. That was capturing 20 minutes of discussion in two minutes. Um, let me ask Nicole, is, is she online? Yeah? She can hear me and we can hear her. Go ahead, Nicole. Hi there, thank you. Good morning, everyone. Great to be here. I'm just gonna quickly summarize the conversation that we had online. Um, so, um, lots of the participants said they liked the idea of traceability and the blockchain. Um, we talked a lot about the challenges of using technology um, with such as internet access and energy access to local communities and how that's um, an aspect of capacity building that could potentially be part of an enhanced role for um, intermediary actors um, and the need to have people on the ground who can use technology and the framework um, of accessing money. Um, and we also talked about um, the need for languages to be understood by communities and how this can increase two-way accountability. Um, but yeah, that, the theme of enhancing role of intermediary, intermediary actors came through quite strongly in the online discussion. Um, I don't know if Aaron wants to add anything. Yeah, also one thing that come, came up is that uh, when we have been implementing these projects is that uh, the local communities should know the people that they should report to in case of any, any issues arise or anything that goes wrong. And also, like Nicola said, having these projects that are understood in the language of the local communities and making sure that the local communities participate so that uh, they're able to monitor and report in case of anything and um, hold the people who are implementing the projects accountable. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Nicole. We heard the push for, for collective action, so great, great demonstration. And I'll come to Helen. Fantastic. So we had a great conversation. I'm going to also do a May, do a May, and try and summarize three main points in one minute. So I just want to highlight, I think we talked a lot about the importance of governance and the space for communities to hold governments to account at multiple levels, the importance of the local level state, the importance of partnerships uh, with, between CSOs and the local level, but also the responsiveness of government. So we can have these participatory processes, but where's the response? How do we support and enable that response to take place? Uh, we talked then related to that, 
how to work at both ends. You can't just work with the government. You might also need to work with the community, with the organisations, the World Bank and others, to also help them put the pressure on the governments as necessary. Not only the pressure on the World Bank, but the World Bank's role in facilitating that participation and ensuring that it takes place. And finally, we came back to data. We've talked a lot about data, data for trust. But related to that, we talked about low-hanging fruit. And there were some great ideas about kind of some of the data, how we could make it more accessible, including whether or not we are actually measuring the right thing, whether we're so focused on people that we're not focused on the quality and the change that's happening. So thank you to the group. Thank you, Helen. I think we have captured the room right across. Um, and and I, I think two things that stood out across, across both groups, um, the three groups, is this push for real collective action to enhance the accountability and transparency. Um, I think it was pretty that said, data is queen, we'll accept that. <laughs> we'll accept that. So I'm gonna now hand over to Peter? Peter. Yes, it's Dutch. Yes. In my best Dutch, Peter. Um, so just give us some reflections on this session as, as you saw it. Thank you. I'll just stand if you, if you, mind, if you don't mind. Um, this is super interesting. I think a very rich discussion and um, maybe just some perspective from, from our, uh, our side. So we endorsed the principles last year at COP and um, quite frankly, um, it was a bit of a push because our senior management was obviously very much for, but then we posed the questions and when they saw the principles, they were like, wow, that, that's scary, right? So we need to be flexible. So we need to devolve decision making <laughs> um, and all of that. And we had a bit of a frank discussion. I said, yeah, well, this is, you know, this is what it is about, honestly. You know? um, if you look at the figures, and I won't repeat them, but we know there's an issue. So are we sincere? And so I don't think the Netherlands is super progressive. I think we're forward leaning. Um, I can't say, Uname, in all honesty, that we are the best in this. We've endorsed it, right? We're sincere. But that doesn't mean that everyone within the ministry is, is you know, fully on board. This is the honest answer. I, I wanna, we're talking about trust, right? I think we should be sincere in this. But I think what we need is people like you to advocate this is needed. You talk about the World Bank. I think we need more of this discussion to you know, have that buzz. Then we need partnerships. We talked about it, and we're talking about IIED and others, how we can make this work on our side and we're we're going through that challenge right where it's a prob probably be a bit of an uphill battle but i think we're doing the right thing we're not there uh certainly not but um we want to you know move the needle and uh and see what works and we want to learn from you what's not working um and i think maybe as as i don't know if it's a advice but i think finding the right people in the organizations that are advocating for this is key. Because you now have the government of the Netherlands that has endorsed this, that's finding the right people that are advocating for this in, in these institutions uh, that are signing up to this, I think is key to help progress the agenda. Um, you know, we're, we're a small country, but the ministry is a very large organization. <laughs> <laughs> and there's a lot of different blood groups and different interests in these institutions. So finding um, who you need at which stage, I think, is, is key. Um, so please consider as a partner. Don't think that we're there. Um, Sheila said, you're in it or you're out. We love to be in it. Um, I hope, I'm, I'm not sure if you should be patient with us, but um, please, yeah, see us as a partner. But I'm, I'm hesitant to say that we're, um, we're very progressive. I would love to be, but um, yeah. I don't know if that was um, what you were looking for. <laughs> but let me pass it back to you, Uname. 
I, I think that's enough for now. The Netherlands, as we say, has checked into Hotel California, LLA. <laughs> and I'll make a disclaimer. Um, I lived there for a while, so, I, but I don't know Peter. So, but they are frank and open, so we believe you. And so we can tell that young activist, we believe you. All right? I'll now pass to Helen for the closure of what I consider to be a, a great morning and a great start. Fantastic. Thank you all for joining us this morning. I think it was a really great and energetic discussion about the, uh, the challenges and the opportunities of uh, delivering better accountability. Um, well, there is loads of information about the locally led adaptation principles that you can read by, I think that might be a bit big to scan, but we can share it. It's on the IID website. You may have a giant phone that you can scan that with. Um, but I would like to just highlight a few things that, because I think there was such a rich conversation there. So just to go with a few of the headlines. Well, firstly, there was a quote from Sheila that I absolutely loved, which was all about the kind of participatory holding people to account where she basically said, I'm sorry, she's gone. I'm hoping she's not going to tell... Is she still here? I can't see her. But she, I'm hoping she won't mind me just repeating this because I thought it was wonderful. She said, poor people will tell you what they think you want to hear because your questions are boring. And so they want to get to the things they want to tell you. So how do we create the space at the local level to enable them to tell you what, what really has to happen and what difference that's making? I really like that quote about, you know, it comes back to kind of who holds the power and the dynamics and all of those questions. We also heard a lot about data. So the importance of data, but data which is trusted and verifiable. And I liked, again, a suggestion that we could encourage the private sector to pay the local communities, perhaps, for their great data collection capacities. And we heard about the importance of co-production and co-design. Um, so again, you know, what are the opportunities to co-design and how can we then perhaps use some of the great ideas and minds and people in this room and beyond who are working on this to help shape the global goal and, the, and ensuring that LLA, accountability, etc. is front and foremost in those discussions. I'm not going to dwell. It was a fantastic set of discussions. I would like to reiterate the point John made Please do come and find us if you're interested in the uh, accountability work that we're doing. If you want to share some ideas, join a conversation. And I think there might be, here we go, another slide. Let me come over here. Some of these have already happened, but please do. There are a couple more events uh, which are taking place over the next couple of days on locally led adaptation. Um, so I just highlight a few loads going on on Saturday, so please clear your diaries Saturday afternoon from 3.30 onwards for an afternoon of LLA joy and excitement and action because the champions are also going to be talking about adaptation finance, so it's going to be great and there might even be some wine and some chocolate. So please do join us on Saturday and thank you all very much for your participation this morning. Thank you.